Hey there, listeners. You've tuned in to another episode of The Infinite Podcast with your host, yours truly, and by my side, the man who's always right, except when he's wrong, Simon. So today we're delving into this wild new insight about trees, chatting it up underground. Get this. Dr. Suzanne Seamard blew minds with her talk on the wood wide web. Yep, trees have their own internet through fungi. Sounds like nature's dark web scenario, am I right? Simon, thoughts on that? Man, so you're telling me trees are sliding into each other's DMs with mushroom Wi-Fi? What's next? Pine trees posting selfies with the caption feeling sappy. Wild. Trees with a social network. Nature's doing it better. Absolutely. Trees are like the cool kids with their own secret club. These mycorrhizal networks, fancy term for fungi roots combo, basically let trees swap sugars, signals, and even help out their sick neighbors by sharing nutrients. It's peer-to-peer -peer sharing, but with actual peers, as in tree peers. So next time you see a forest, think of it as a bustling community where everyone knows everyone. The wood wide web is more like an old school neighborhood gossip chain. No wonder the maples and the pines sometimes have beef. They're probably throwing shade in more ways than one. Hey Birch, heard you lost some leaves? Bed Oak gave you a bad review on timber. Maple's throwing so much shade, it's messing up Birch's photosynthesis. Guess Maple's trying to leaf its mark, but Birch isn't taking it lying down. Might just bark up the wrong tree. So branching out here, get it? But for real, trees like the Birch have this whole network underground. They're not just standing there looking pretty. They chat through chemicals, and these mycorrhizal fungi act as avengers. <laughs> It's a tip-top system that's been working way before our Wi-Fi ever existed. If a tree gets munched on by bugs, they can send out a distress signal through this network, and other trees might start oozing out their own bug repellent. Kind of like, heads up folks, we've got munchers. Then you have ancient beliefs where folks thought all plants were connected. Turns out Granny Oak wasn't just tall tales and acorn soup. She was onto something with those everything's connected bedtime stories. If trees ever start a podcast, I bet it would be called Roots and All. Real raw underground stories. Welcome back to the latest buzz on bark beetles. Stay tuned for our leafy gossip segment, Who's Branching Out This Season? Roots and All, the TMZ of the tree world. I'd subscribe. Can you imagine their clickbait? Elms eavesdropping, shocking secrets unveiled. So this one time, I'm hiking, right? And it's like whispers everywhere the rustling leaves, the creaking branches. Suddenly, a mini tree guy, a sapling, catches my eye. Here's this little dude surrounded by these towering trees, shielded, pampered almost. Then it hits me. What if this little fella is actually a networking superstar? Like maybe he's tapping into that Rudy broadband, downloading survival tips from his tall friends. Just picture this tiny guy, getting all the forest gossip straight from the source. Hey, tiny. This is how you fend off those gnarly beetles or st squirrel attack pattern intel. It's like every little plant is in this grand survival seminar. And guess who's giving the keynote? Good old Mother Nature. Probably telling all the saplings, stay rooted, but never wooden. Stay grounded, but always strive to branch out. Leaf no stone unturned, but watch out for the birds. You know, if trees could text, Autumn would be like their group chat going off with out-of-office replies. Gone red for the season. If urgent, contact my roots. Actually, trees shedding leaves is their way of conserving water and energy for the winter. They're like cutting down on expenses when they know rough times are ahead. Smart move. When we say trees talk, we mean they communicate through chemical signals released into the air called volatile organic compounds, VOCs. These alerts warn other trees about pests, prompting them to produce defensive chemicals. Plus, their root systems connect with mycorrhizal fungi networks, which lets them exchange resources like carbon, nitrogen, and water. It's a silent but super efficient convo and keeps the whole forest in the loop. Pretty clever for a bunch of bark and branches, huh? Talk about hitting the mute button when winter comes, right? Trees are like everyone, Please hold all calls till spring. I'm on energy saving mode. And with those volatile organic compounds, VOCs, I mean, they take silent but deadly to a new level. Here they are. 
whispering through the forest airwaves, Sst, incoming caterpillars at five o'clock. And meanwhile, we humans think it's all just tree-hugging hippie talk. Go figure. Hey, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? If we were able to listen in on those whispers, what kind of secrets do you reckon we'd learn from an old forest? Funny you mention that. So there's this old forest near my grandparents' place, right? This one time as a kid, I was in those woods after a storm. You could feel the tension like the trees were catching their breath after a wild night. I'm walking and tripping over branches, classic me, and I get to this ancient-looking tree where all paths converged, a real gnarly character, big as life itself. Now my grandpa told me, son, every ring in that tree is a story. And here I am, hands on the bark, kind of hoping for a Pocahontas moment, whispering winds and wise messages. Just then, a huge branch falls off right next to me. Scared me silly, but it also got me thinking. It's like that branch had lived its life to the fullest, been through countless seasons, weathered many storms, a lifetime of the forest's secrets sealed within it, made me wonder what else those trees had seen and, if they could talk, what tales they'd tell. Probably about how to live deeply rooted yet always reaching upwards, how to bend with the wind, not break against it. Life lessons straight from nature's giants, their living proof of survival and making a comeback, much like they do after crazy storms. You start to think, if only we could decode their chatter, we'd learn so much more than just science. We'd grasp a deeper lesson about resilience. Felt like a lot of wisdom under that canopy, echoing with each leaf's rustle. Life's greatest lessons often come whispered, not shouted, don't they? Absolutely, the quiet moments teach us the most. Absolutely, Simon. The science behind tree communication is a fascinating branch of study called forest ecology. Researchers found that trees indeed communicate through their roots and fungal networks, called the wood wide web, sharing resources and alerts about environmental stress. When speaking of distress signals, they send out those VOCs we mentioned. They do more than just spread warnings. Some attract predator insects that feed on herbivores threatening the trees. And regarding growth, older trees manage light distribution by altering their leaves, allowing saplings below to receive sunlight. This complex social network is critical for their survival, emphasizing that each tree's health impacts the whole forest. It tackles a bit of botany, chemistry, even some aspects of community dynamics. In a nutshell, it reveals an elegant balance in nature, where cooperation triumphs, optimizing the whole ecosystem's life cycle. Knowing this can encourage sustainable forestry practices and inform how we approach biodiversity conservation. It's definitely not just about planting trees, but nurturing the intricate relationships between them. Understanding the depth and intricacies of arboreal chatter is a powerful reminder of our interconnectedness with the natural world. Mind-blowing how trees are all about that teamwork, right? Nature's teamwork at its finest, for sure. I guess when trees send out distress signals, it's their version of a group chat saying, Hey, Marvin the Moth's back. Let's roll out the unwelcome mat. Can you imagine if they sent emojis instead of chemicals? A little leaf frowning face every time there's a caterpillar invasion. If trees used emojis, we'd see a forest full of reactions to pests. In reality, their chemical signals serve as crucial SOS alerts within the ecosystem. Plants under attack release VOCs that not only warn neighboring vegetation, but also attract natural predators of the pests, creating a self-sustaining defense system. This is part of a broader science called allelopathy, which is how organisms affect each other with biochemicals. The wood wide web, a term popularized by scientist Suzanne Simard speaks to mycorrhizal networks, intricate systems of fungi connecting tree roots underground. They transport information and resources, like a communal bank account that evens out the forest's resource distribution. It's survival through sharing, optimizing health collectively rather than individually. Research in this field opens up possibilities for agriculture and forestry, from enhancing crop resistance to integrating these principles into sustainable practices. Understanding the silent language of trees could revolutionize our approach to working with nature. It's communication at its most complex and most organic, a symphony of life's deep interconnectedness played out beneath our feet.
So, trees are basically the unsung heroes of the sharing is caring philosophy. Imagine what else we could learn if we really tuned in to their underground symphony. What do you think's next for us in understanding and applying this silent language? Speaking of learning from trees, it's wild to think about the secrets they could share if only we knew how to listen. Take historical battlefields. Forests have silently witnessed strategies and skirmishes, offering sanctuary or becoming natural barriers during war. The influence of wooded terrains on many historical events is undeniable. Consider deforestation. It dismantles these ancient networks, severing communication lines as old as the trees themselves. Then there's legends like General Sherman or the Lone Tree of Tenere. Imagine what they've seen in their time. Right? But let's not romanticize it too much. These forests did more than just stand tall and look pretty during battles. They were the original stealth mode. Dense forests could be why some armies won, giving them the ultimate hide-and-seek spot or a natural fortress against enemies. Talk about home field advantage. Now, deforestation. It's like someone took an eraser to history itself, wiping out these complex networks along with any ancient secrets. Kinda makes you think twice before printing on paper, huh? And those legendary trees, like General Sherman, what tales would they tell? Talk about being rooted in history, if only they had a mouth, apart from what they saw, the whole forest's network chatter must have been insane. Sst, looks like another empire falling today, boys. They're practically the elder statesmen of the plant world. Too bad we can't tune into their woodcast of historical events. While the notion of forests as silent guardians and observers through time is poetic, we also have to acknowledge they're not always passive players. Dense woodlands could be a source of disorientation for armies not accustomed to fighting in such terrain. Just think about ambushes where the native knowledge of the landscape was pivotal. Now regarding deforestation, it could be argued that selecting forest areas for timber has, regretfully, been driven by necessity, ranging from material needs to societal development. Every lost tree does mean a break in the complex network, yeah? But historically, this process helped fuel economies and build civilizations. And let's consider General Sherman. Magnificent, yes, but just one cog in a massive biological machine. Exalting single trees risks overlooking the importance of the entire ecosystem. Historically, those networks were less about individual statesmen and more about the combined resilience and adaptability of the community. It's fascinating stuff. Understanding how these natural systems work may offer insight and guidance, even as humanity aims to balance progress with sustainability. Really makes you think about balance, doesn't it? Indeed, balance is key. Throughout history, forests have acted as both shelters and obstacles in warfare, shifting the tides of conflict. This dance between exploiting and conserving nature highlights humanity's struggle to find that equilibrium. With deforestation, each tree felled may represent a lost chapter in Earth's narrative. Yet historical forest clearance also cleared paths for civilization expansion, towns, agriculture, industries. The dilemma continues. How do we honor these ecosystems while fostering human development? Reflecting on storied trees like General Sherman offers perspective. They are part of an intricate tapestry where every plant, creature, and microbe plays a role. Historical events were shaped by such networks. Now, understanding and preserving them might shape our future. It adds urgency to environmental discourse, not just to save individual celebrity trees, but to maintain the harmonious pulse of life they're all connected to. Growth and green can go hand in hand, history's lesson. History's lesson indeed. Smart growth respects the green. Precisely, Joe. It's about growth with greens in mind. Absolutely, Simon. History shows that managing forest resources and urban expansion isn't mutually exclusive. Considering Europe during the Middle Ages or early colonial America, trees were pivotal in shipbuilding, fueling exploration and trade, while also serving as communal resources that had to be managed sustainably. In military history, forests have been crucial tactical elements. The Battle of Teutoburg Forest, where Germanic tribes ambushed Roman legions, dramatically reshaped the Roman Empire's borders. On the flip side, Great Britain strategically used Navy-controlled forests to maintain its fleet, 
highlighting early conservation practices out of sheer necessity. Then take deforestation. Aside from affecting tree communication, removing ancient woodlands impacts biodiversity, water cycles, and carbon storage capacities, affecting climate and air quality for all species, including us. Dynamic examples exist through time, from the silk roads lined with shelter-giving trees to the General Sherman tree, witnessing centuries of ecological change. These observations are foundational for modern conservation strategies, showcasing the intricate balance necessary between development and ecological preservation. Lessons from the past to chart a wiser, greener future. Learn from history. Now we craft a sustainable path forward. History's classroom for our green tomorrow. Let's get it right. Certainly, if we regard history as a classroom, trees have been both the silent sentinels and inadvertent participants in our story. Looking back, the use of woods in military maneuvers, forests were places to hide, seek refuge, or create ambushes. The aforementioned Battle of Teutoburg Forest, which occurred in 9 AD, led to the Romans' devastating defeat and significantly halted their expansion into Germania. Conservation out of necessity. Britain's navy oaks were carefully conserved to ensure timber for ships remained available, showcasing early recognition of sustainable practices. Deforestation impacts. The clearing of forests during various periods like the American westward expansion showed immediate economic gains but long-term ecological damage, influencing today's policies on responsible land management. Forest communication research reveals potential for more sustainable agriculture, reduced pesticide use, and better carbon sequestration methods, all of which are critical in the face of climate change. Combining these lessons from the past with current knowledge, it's clear that preserving and understanding forest ecosystems isn't just about honoring historical significance. It's about ensuring a resilient, thriving future, one where human activity doesn't silence these intricate biological conversations, but rather works in harmony with them. Harmony with nature, not dominance. That's the real progress. True progress respects nature, not conquers it. Harmony wins. But here's a twist. What if forests aren't just passive players, but influential ones? I mean, think about it. Those timber tales aren't just backdrops to human shenanigans. These woodlands could actually be shaping history with their own leafy agendas. What if General Sherman had leaflets, pun intended, influencing policy, eh? Or consider the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. As much as it was Germanic strategy, maybe it was also the forest itself going, nah, Romans, not in my backyard. It's like nature's got its own game and we're just pieces on the board. Makes you wonder who's really calling the shots, the generals or the general greenery. Nature's not just scenery, it's a player shaping the game. Hold up, does nature really play or does it just sit tight and look pretty? I'd argue we're reading too much into the rustling leaves. The forests don't have a grand scheme. They don't get to roll the dice. It's people who are making the calls using bits of nature as part of the plan, or clearing it away when it's in the path of progress. Maybe those timber chronicles are less about whispering woodland wisdom and more about humans projecting stories onto those stoic trunks and branches. I'll push back on that. Yes, we drive the bulldozers and draft the policies, but don't discount the power of natural forces. Trees might not plot and scheme, but they create conditions that shape human choices. Soil erosion after deforestation can change entire societies' fates, forcing migrations, for instance. It's a two-way street. Nature sets the board, we move the pieces, sure, but sometimes those trees are moving us in more ways than we're willing to admit. Some real food for thought there, Joe. If trees could talk, maybe they'd say we're not just chopping wood, we're unknowingly carving up history. Makes you wonder what tales these timber chronicles would tell if the forests had a voice in our human story, huh? Life lessons aside, history's dotted with some lighter moments where we've hilariously misread nature's signals. Ever heard those tales about sacred trees that'll grant your wishes if you whisper to them right? Or flip side, they'll curse you if you step on their roots? It's like every culture's got a story where someone thinks the trees are part of the gossip chain. Let's mix it up. Listeners, hit us with your funniest tree-related mix-ups. Maybe as a kid, 
You thought trees could talk back or protect you from monsters. And for kicks, let's imagine what historical figures might have comically misconstrued from their leafy advisors. What do you say, Simon? Napoleon gets strategic advice from an oak, but all he hears is leaves rustling. Napoleon consulting an oak. Sire, take Russia, he thinks it says. Meanwhile, the trees just complaining about squirrels in French, and those sacred trees granting wishes, if I had a nickel for every time I wished and got zip, I'd have enough to buy a forest and hire a tree whisperer for better results. Napoleon and his battling oak, it's the squirrels plotting all along. Those whispers in the woods might as well have been the furry masterminds of history. And about those wishing trees, Simon, maybe they're just picky listeners, eh? You wish for a bike, they think you said hike. There you are, empty-handed, but hey, at least you're getting good exercise. So folks, what comical mix-ups have you had with nature's not-so-clear messaging? Ever convince yourself a tree was giving you life advice when really it was just shedding leaves on your head? Let's hear those stories. I mean, sure, trees giving us dodgy advice is one thing, but what if they're actually throwing shade? Not in the leafy sense, but real sassy-like. Picture George Washington taking a break under a cherry tree. Instead of confessing to chopping it down, he's there asking career advice, and all it murmurs back is, stick to wooden dentures, pal. Listeners, I bet you've got tales that top that. Ever chat up a birch only to have a bird bomb your moment of zen? The trees are snickering, folks, I'm telling you. George Washington and his sassy cherry tree. Now that's an image. Maybe if those trees could truly talk, they'd spend all day throwing sass instead of shade. Oh, you want to cut me down? Good luck building anything straight with the way you can't even draw a straight line. And yes, listeners, we're looking at you now. Did your childhood treehouse double as a secret gossip hub where you were absolutely convinced the old maple was in on the tea spilling? Get creative. Try to top our George story, or maybe outdo Simon's birch and bird fiasco. What's the sassiest thing you've imagined a tree saying to you during a heart-to-heart? -heart? That tree would probably just say, leave me alone. Ha! That's tree humor at its finest. But seriously, Simon, have you had a moment with nature where it felt like the universe was giving you a solid nudge or winking at you through the foliage? Absolutely, Joe. Once upon a blustery day, I'm out thinking life's big thoughts, right? Lean against this willow and hear what sounds like whispering. I'm all ears for wisdom or maybe winning lottery numbers. Instead, a branch smacks my head. If that ain't the universe saying, wake up, Simon, stop daydreaming. But no lottery numbers. Rude if you ask me. That willow was all action, less chit-chat. But let's flip the script. We look to nature for signs, but it's not always profound wisdom, is it? Maybe the universe gets a kick out of these moments. Picture your Caesar, and every time you pass that laurel tree, you swear it's cheering you on, only for it to be the rustle of laurel wreaths falling off people's heads in disbelief as you declare yourself dictator for life. The trees have that dry sense of humor, don't they? Caesar mistaking laurel rustles for applause is one thing, but what about poor old Plato? Imagine him strolling the Academia Grove looking for deep truths and every breeze is misheard as Plato, my man, just makes stuff up. Nobody will know. No wonder we got the theory of forms. Those trees were having a laugh. Or picture Shakespeare getting his best lines from overhearing the oaks, to be or not to be, and it's actually two bees are on that tree. Entire plays written off woodland misquotes. It's like nature's the ultimate prankster, but who wouldn't enjoy that twist? Shakespeare inspired by Buzz, greatest poetic twist of all time. Bard meets bees, buzzwords become timeless quotes. Imagine that, Simon, each buzz and rustle turning into iconic soliloquies. Makes you think, what other masterpieces are just misheard mutterings of Mother Nature? Listeners, got any theories or fun historical hiccups where a whisper in the woods could have led to legendary lines? Share them. We're all ears. Just like those chatty trees. Speaking of these whispers and supposed guidance from trees, Joe, it's almost like they've got their own society going on, right? Like how trees in a forest share resources and kind of look out for each other through this underground network. Feels like there's some deep-rooted wisdom there about cooperation that we could learn from. 
Like, what if we modeled our communities on these arboreal networks? Could we make our society more sustainable? What do you reckon our cities would look like if they were planned out like a forest ecosystem? Less concrete, more communal cities as alive as forests. Yeah, Joe. So this reminds me of a camping trip I took. Middle of nowhere, right? Dense, untouched woods. And the campsite is just harmony. Different groups, all strangers, but everyone's sharing supplies, stories, even helping pitch tents. Felt like those trees around us with their invisible connections were kind of showing us how it's done. No borders, no mine or yours, just this unspoken understanding that we're in it together. It hit me then. Maybe that's nature schooling us on coexistence without saying a word. Nature's class is in session. We're just slow learners, Simon. True that. Nature's patient, but are we good students? Doubtful. Might be harsh, but we're not great pupils. Instead of copying nature's homework on cooperation, humanity often crams for the Profit 101 test instead. Coexistence takes a back seat when there are short-term gains to be grabbed. The forest plays the long game, society sprinting a marathon and wondering why it's out of breath. Maybe it's time to slow down and learn from these old growth professors, eh? Time to adopt a forest mindset, I'd say. Absolutely. Think like a tree. Grow with your community. Grow with the community. Nice. But let's not go hugging every tree just yet, right, Joe? Trees do teach us about working together, but they've also got that competitive edge. Tallest trees grab the most sun. It isn't all share and care. Maybe there's a lesson there, too. Balance, maybe? Like, how do we blend that cooperative spirit with healthy competition without bulldozing the whole forest down in our human race? Perfect mix. Cooperation with a dash of friendly rivalry. I mean, look at how trees do it. There's this give and take in the forest that keeps things stable. Some trees shade and support the youngins, while others reach for the stars, right? So let's try translating that to people terms. What if, say, businesses teamed up on environmental goals, like they're all part of one big canopy, but still hustled to outdo each other's creativity or customer service? Same end game, different strategies, symbiosis with a side of competition. Could be the future we're aiming for. But here's a thought. What if that balance tips? Businesses may plant seeds for sustainability, but if the hustle for growth overshadows, we're no better than invasive species. Could push us all into scarcity mode. Sure, trees compete and cooperate, but remember, they don't do quarterly reports. So I reckon we've got to redefine winning, not just outgrow, but also nurture, like the forest giants shielding saplings. Is winning about reaching highest, or is it ensuring the whole forest thrives? You've hit the nail on the head, man. Coexisting isn't just about living side by side, it's about thriving together. But, but that's where we trip up. We keep score like it's all a big game. Who's got more? Who's on top? But what if we flip the script? Imagine winning as creating the most value for your patch of earth, not just expanding your turf. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? How would our world change if businesses bragged about how much they gave back instead of how much they earned? Would we start seeing CEOs boasting about planting trees instead of profits? Now there's a wild thought. Imagine that quarterly announcement. Ladies and gents, we've had a record-breaking season in oxygen production. Shareholders can breathe easy, literally, because our carbon sequestration stats are through the canopy. Let's plant that idea and watch it grow, huh? I get your point, Joe, and it's a nice picture you're painting. But let's entertain the other side for a sec. Going full throttle on the greener path isn't just sunshine and rain showers for businesses. There's this gnarly tangle of economic pressures we can't ignore. Profit isn't a dirty word. It funds innovation, pays wages, and drives growth. Sure, ideas like oxygen produced sound solid for PR, but bottom lines and investors might have a heart attack. It's a tough balancing act. Yes, embrace the tree wisdom, but don't forget to turn enough green into gold to keep the whole operation running too. It's tricky, Simon. We graft new ideals on old business models, sometimes get shade instead of fruits. This whole tremendous debate, it's about finding the sun through the canopy, striking that balance without losing our roots in either profit or planet. So where do we branch out from here? Speaking of branching out, 
Joe, this whole talk about trees being all communal has me thinking. Have you heard about those studies on trees and the whole wood wide web deal? Get this. They're saying trees could have their own kind of smarts. Like, okay, maybe not plotting world domination or anything, but what if they're doing more than just soaking up sun and sipping on water? What if they're actually aware somehow? Talk about a mind bender, right? The idea is wild, Simon. Trees might not be penning novels, but scientists find they communicate through a network often called the Wood Wide Web. It's all thanks to these fungi underground, mycorrhizal networks, acting like nature's internet. They're not just sharing nutrients, but also information, warning each other about pests and droughts. It's this huge, intricate system that's millions of years old. If that doesn't at least hint at some level of knowing, I don't know what does. We're talking complex, responsive systems here, a far cry from the stoic lumber we used to believe them to be. Conscious, maybe not like us, but sentient, who knows? This could change the whole game on how we view and treat plant life. You're telling me my ficus might be gossiping about the shabby secondhand couch in my living room? Man, that's some next level eavesdropping. If plants are this chatty Cathy with their fungus friends, maybe that's why my cactus gave up on me. Heard through the grapevine, I was bad news for greenery. Your ficus throwing shade over your couch choice? Priceless. But let's not hand out diplomas to these tree networks just yet. They're incredible, sure, still miles from a chinwag over the white picket fence. Trees don't do consciousness, or at least, not in ways that we typically understand. Our brains send electrical signals. Trees send chemical ones. It's less brainy banter, more survival spam email. Does that qualify as consciousness? The jury's still out there, hugging trees for answers. And if they ever find proof, we better buckle up for some tough ethical chats about how we treat our leafy neighbors. Survival spam email, huh? But let's poke at that thought bubble for a sec. If these trees and fungi are zapping messages underground like they're teenagers on social media, doesn't that make us wonder about all this chopping and building we do? Imagine if we figured out they've got something like a consciousness light package running. What does it mean for us then? We might feel more guilty than sneaking out wood from the office printer for personal stuff. Sorry, tree, didn't mean to turn you into my IKEA bookshelf. It's not just ethical, it's existential, man. Are we in a network without even knowing it? Like the vegetation matrix? Whoa. Trees with consciousness light? Could you imagine the first time a tree gets woke? Bro, I just realized I'm wood, and that chair is wood. Am I the chair? Are we all one big arbor armchair? It's like tree vanna, enlightenment for the forest dwellers. Next thing you know, trees will be demanding internet access for their underground network and privacy rights from nosy scientists. Leave us alone, they'll say. That's gold, Joe. But let me ask you. If a tree did get woke and started twigging out about being the chair, how do you think that would change our approach to, say, park benches or those rustic log cabins? Would we start feeling bad sitting on a tree's face? If we ever prove tree consciousness, it's no leap to guess we'd start tiptoeing around the woods like an awkward party after breaking something. Logging, carpentry, suddenly every chop or saw buzz carries weight. We can't be park bench bullies or log cabin lords if we're sitting on sentient beings, right? It would spark a total reevaluation of our use of wood, maybe pushing innovations in material science or upping our conservation efforts. It's Mother Nature's house rules then. Oh yeah, tackling this tree consciousness thing means getting down into the roots of our understanding. So, these mycorrhizal networks, scientists call them the wood wide web like we're all casual about it now, are fascinating hubs of exchange where trees swap nutrients and information and even support each other. It's giving us real avatar vibes. Applying what we know from cognitive sciences, consciousness usually involves awareness, sensations, thoughts, intentions. A whole mixed salad of complexity that traditionally we only associate with animals. Trees don't have brains or neurons, but they've got this cellular signaling happening. Deforestation is already a hot-button topic because of its impact on climate change and biodiversity loss. Bundle in some potential type of plant sentience, that sparks an ethical wildfire. 
If we start assigning any level of consciousness to trees, it's not just chopping wood anymore, it's hacking into Mother Nature's neural network. Talk about a foundational shakeup. City planning, logging regulations, vegetation management could all get flipped on their heads if trees are suddenly part of the consciousness club, even on a guest pass. So with all those implications budding, it's safe to say we wouldn't be able to leaf well enough alone. You've got a point, Simon. But let's not start handing out tree diplomas just yet. They might decide to branch off into philosophy, and the next thing you know, we're debating Bark Teleby the Scrivener on whether it's better to be a birch or a beech. Can you imagine? To photosynthesize or not to photosynthesize? Or do I root around for a new identity? It'd be enough to make your head spin, leafing through all those wooden philosophies. Haha, <laughs> Joe, if trees start getting philosophical on us, I'm out. Let's ground this, though. We get all tangled in semantics with terms like consciousness. It's not about trees mulling over their purpose under the sun, but recognizing they're more complex than silent statues in the forest. Ethically, if we have to consider a tree's right to, well, be a tree, it reshapes how humanity interacts with the environment. Not just regarding deforestation, but integrating respect for trees into our daily lives and urban designs. Maybe we'd see fewer cookie-cutter neighborhoods bulldozing groves, instead designing around existing greenery. You know, respect the old wood wide web. Plus, that might make cities cooler, literally and figuratively. So it's less about tree therapy, more about our sustainability blueprint. Absolutely, Joe. It's sustainability with a side of respect. If trees have this underground social network, helping buddies out, sharing the dirt, literally, then we've got to rethink our slash and build strategy. We shouldn't wait for them to start singing Kumbaya to give them their due credit. It pushes us towards urban development that doesn't just bulldoze, but carefully carves out space for nature. The real shift is treating trees not like decorations, but like the living, contributing beings they are. They're not conscious like you or me, but hey, if they're keeping each other in the loop on the neighborhood's latest bug infestation, that's pretty savvy. And funny enough, being kinder to trees, turns out it's also a win for us. Cleaner air, less heat, more chill spots to relax after work. It's not a bad deal, thinking of those philosophical photons and all that jazz. Smart design, less bulldozing, more eco-respecting. Good for us, good for trees. Man, Joe, this whole chat reminds me of my grandma's place. She had this massive oak in the yard. As a kid, I built a tree house in it. Not an ugly one, but quite the pad. Whenever we visited, I was up there pretending to be some kind of pirate or space captain. Years later, developers eyed her land, the oak included. Grandma put her foot down. She wouldn't let them touch it, said it was part of the family. They built around that tree instead. You should see it now. It's the centerpiece of the whole cul-de-sac. Makes me wonder if maybe Grandma felt that consciousness light vibe we're yapping about. It's like she knew the tree's deeper value beyond wood and shade. Maybe she was onto something even before all these smarts people started talking about the tree network thingamajigs. That's touching about your grandma, Simon. But let's spice it up. Did her oak have consciousness? No family tree reunions or acorn allowances there, right? Your grandma saw intrinsic value, not consciousness light, but old school respect for nature. Nowadays, everyone's quick to slap a sentient sticker on anything that moves, or well, grows. We're in this age where mystery gets rerouted to pseudoscience alley too fast. Acknowledging complexity and having reverence for life, that should be the norm, not just because research dresses it in fancy neural network clothes. Grandma's intuition versus modern science, it's all about balance. If we tip too far into woo-woo land, we might overlook real solutions for sustainable living in search of tree chakras or arboreal astrological signs. Let's not romanticize their worth. These oxygen buddies keep our planet and podcasts alive. So, are trees conscious or just highly efficient survivalists hooking up through the vegetation matrix? Maybe the answer's somewhere between science and your pirate space captain adventures, a middle ground rooted, pun intended, in respect and reason. You're right, Joe. Who needs tree chakras when you've got real science mixed with a dash of grandma wisdom? Trees may not be out buying self-help books anytime soon, 
but that doesn't make their underground shenanigans any less mind-blowing. So, they're probably not tree-conscious, but they certainly seem to have a handle on the whole living network thing better than my Wi-Fi ever will. So let's park this talk on whether trees know their trees and dive into something less woody. How about those philosophical photons, eh? Does soaking up the sun count as a kind of enlightenment for these green giants? I say we dig into it. Speaking of things that stand the test of time, like that steadfast oak at your grandma's place, let's transition smoothly into another realm of timeless value. Mechanical watches. They're making a real comeback, you know? It's fascinating how we're winding back to appreciate craftsmanship in an age ruled by digital. For sure, Joe. TikTok goes the trend clock, and suddenly mechanical watches are back in vogue. It's like a horological renaissance. You've got to hand it to them. The skill to piece together that tiny ticking town of gears and springs, that's hardcore craft worth tipping your hat to. In this insta-everything world, slapping on a mechanical watch is almost like a quiet rebellion, like saying you value the maker's mark over mass-market battery-fed timekeepers. Plus, there's something deeply personal about winding up your watch. You're not just checking the time, you're carrying on a tradition. Watches with tech wizardry have their charm, but no touchscreen can give you that intricate dance of cogs and wheels. People are craving tangibility, man. They want a story around their wrist, not just a gadget. In a digital era, going analog with your ticker makes a statement. It says, I'm timeless, without uttering a word. Yeah, Simon, craftsmanship's great and all, but come on, most folks can't even read an analog clock these days. Here's the deal. Mechanical watches are thick with nostalgia, sure. They hit the feels button with their old-timey vibes. They're heirlooms, not timepieces. But let's not forget practicality for sentiment's sake. Is this renaissance fueled by genuine appreciation, or just another fad for those who want to wear their bank account on their sleeve? Are digital time wranglers smartphones and smartwatches, they're hard to beat. They strap convenience to your wrist like nothing else. So here's the twist. Is mastering mechanics for heritage's sake really superior? Or are we just spinning gears in a sentimental machine while tech quietly revolutionizes our world, one vibration notification at a time? Do you reckon it's really time we're experiencing with a mechanical watch or just an elaborate, spring-driven performance art? Let's wind up that conversation, buddy. Hey, new listeners. Joe and I have been diving into the TikTok world of mechanical watches. They're making a comeback. Something about the craftsmanship, that hands-on touch with all those tiny parts inside, which really sings to people's nostalgia. But we've also chewed over whether this is just folks showing off fancy wrist bling, or if there's a deeper appreciation for timeless tech in our digital fast lane. We're contrasting these handcrafted beauties with the convenience of digital watches that do pretty much everything except make coffee. So, yeah, it's about what ticks for you. Sentiment and style with those wind-up wonders or the ultra-practical beep-boop smartwatch on your wrist. That's the heart of our horological hoopla. Craftsmanship or convenience, huh? What's really winning our wrists over? Hey, Joe, think about this. Do you believe it's the craftsmanship and style that's hooking people on mechanical watches, or is the appeal more about making a personal statement in our digitized world? Where does the true value lie for you? Simon, personal statement hits it home for me. Tech watches, they're all buzz and apps. Mechanical watches, that's personal time telling on your terms. It's about choosing a path less paved with pixels, where value isn't just in nanoseconds or heartbeats per minute but in the story spun by hands, both the watchmakers and those on the dial. True value for me? It's not in tech dependency, but in heritage that hums along with life's rhythms, beating out moments mechanically. My wrist real estate goes to craftsmanship that doesn't need an update or a charge. Just give it a wind and let it remind you we're just humans tick-tocking through time, not robots synced to satellites. Right on, Joe keeping it human amidst a world of ones and zeros. But hold on, Simon. Isn't there something to be said for the relentless march of tech? Can we really brood over our love of gears and springs when our phones are smart enough to run our lives? 
Where's the line between appreciating a craftsmanship relic and just resisting change because it's comfortable? Sure, mechanical watches have soul, but let's not get too misty-eyed. We're in an era where time is money, information is king, and convenience is pretty darn convenient. The Renaissance might just be a trend or a statement against the invasion of tech, but it isn't stopping that invasion. Question is, are we appreciating the art of watchmaking or just clinging to the past in a digital tsunami? What's really driving this wrist-worn resistance? Joe, you've unraveled a crucial thread in this wristwatch rebellion. We gotta remember mechanical watches have been the pinnacle of portable timekeeping for centuries. It's like back in the day, having a pocket watch was the equivalent of toting around the latest iPhone. Then with the 1970s quartz revolution, watches went electric. Boom, accuracy skyrocketed while prices plummeted. You'd think mechanicals would become history. Nope, they hung on, clinging by fingertips to heritage and craftsmanship. Fact check, Swiss watch exports, still soaring, especially those handcrafted pieces. Look at brands like Rolex and Patek Philippe. They're not just thriving, they're the heavyweights making KOs in sales. It's more than a surge of nostalgic fancy. It's evidence that artistry and engineering has its own enduring pulse. This renaissance ain't solely about rebelling against our silicon overlords. It's also about embracing human triumph in precision and design. It's an art form, really. And these ticking masterpieces are as much about personal expression as they are about telling time. A nice blend of past mastery with an eye for the future. That's what keeps mechanical watches ticking strong in a smartwatch world. Art form, yes, Simon, but let's get real. When was the last time somebody actually used their mechanical watch to tell time and not just strut around like a peacock? Patek Philippe, Rolex, they're status symbols. Wearing one doesn't say, hey, look at this marvel of engineering. It screams, guess my net worth. I'll concede mechanical watches are a triumph of human ingenuity, but today isn't owning one more about flexing financial muscle than time-telling elegance. So while Swiss watch exports might be soaring, let's ask ourselves, does owning a mechanical timepiece genuinely showcase an appreciation for craftsmanship, or is it just another way to shine in society's limelight? We can romanticize all we want, but the practicality of a buzzing smartwatch that tracks your every move versus the quiet, subtle tick of a handmade luxury watch. The line between practical use and opulent accessory is blurring. Don't confuse survival of tradition with pure lineage. Sometimes an old dog survives just because it learned some capitalist new tricks. Joe, you nailed it. It's a flex and function brawl in the wristwear arena. Luxury watches may be strutting on the catwalk of society's elite, but they also echo the tick of historical mastery and human touch in a high-tech age. For sure, we're mingling status with craftsmanship when we snap up a shiny Swiss timepiece. Yet, there's room to ponder. Is there perhaps more depth to this trend than just dollar signs and vanity? Can tradition and luxury coexist with purpose and appreciation for an art as old as time itself? And that's what keeps the gears turning in this debate, right? What splendid timing riddle do we wind up next? You know, Simon, there's a through line in what we're discussing here. Appreciating the minuscule marvels of mechanical watches leads us straight to the world of minute machinery. These micro-mechanics aren't just about keeping time. They're testaments to human patience and precision. They're heirlooms, partly because they capture an era's essence when gears were king and craftsmanship could be felt with a winding click. Cultural shifts have highlighted an object's backstory as much as its function. This is true art, where every cog and wheel plays its part in a grander narrative. From handcrafted watches to intricate machines small enough to fit in your palm, miniaturization presents huge implications for our capacity to value the patient intricacy over instant production. It's worth diving deeper into this tiny yet immense landscape of micro-precision, don't you think? Absolutely, Joe. That's such a keen observation you've made. In this realm, where the grandeur is found in the minuscule, do you think this shift towards valuing minute machinery reflects our deeper desire for a human touch in an otherwise automated world? Well, Simon, I see where you're coming from, but let's flip the script. 
This shift could be less about craving human touch and more about our obsession with control and perfection. Meticulous machinery represents mastery over complexity. It's a demonstration of conquering the microscopic world through extreme precision. We live in an age obsessed with efficiency. Our phones get thinner, drones get smaller, computers get faster, and tiny, intricate machinery is just another reflection of that ideology. Maybe we don't necessarily yearn for the human touch, but bow to the might of miniaturization because it symbolizes power, the power to innovate, integrate, and dominate nature's limits. In essence, embracing micro-machinery might not signal a return to roots as much as a leap into mastering every possible realm, even if it's one gear at a time. It speaks to our ambition to shrink the world and hold its complexities in the palms of our hands. Micromastery, showing nature we're boss, gear by tiny gear. You got it, man. Conquering nature, piece by tiny piece, it's wild. We're like these giants picking apart the universe, zooming in closer than ever before. It's insane how we've gone from swinging axes to crafting these microscopic gears that you need a magnifying glass to see. But here's the kicker. With every small victory, we're not just showing off. We're pushing boundaries. We're rewriting what's possible. Whether it's the inside of a watch or computer chips, it's all about that relentless human drive to dig deeper, go smaller, and get smarter about the world around us. It's fascinating stuff, a blend of ego, curiosity, and pure skill, all wrapped up in those delicate pieces of minute machinery. Ain't that something? Mind-blowing mastery in mini, giants of ingenuity, that's human nature. Innovation's essence, tiny triumphs, monumental impacts. We keep pushing. We push the small to achieve the big, Joe. Wild. Absolutely, Simon. It takes us right back to the core of human progress. Micro-precision in machinery has paved the way for advancements like improved medical devices that can navigate our veins, chips that power smartphones, and even machines unraveling the quantum realm. These microscopic innovations are fueled by our pursuit of pushing physical boundaries. We've got Swiss watchmakers crafting complications so intricate they become personal black holes of study, each tiny pivot demanding a magnifying glass and a steady hand. Take MEMS technology microelectromechanical systems. These silicon wonders integrate mechanical elements, sensors, actuators, and electronics on a common chip smaller than a dime. They're revolutionizing everything from airbag deployment systems to inkjet printers. At its heart, this micro-precision redefines what's possible across industries, demanding an unmatched level of patience and production accuracy. This niche is where years of expertise meets the challenge of manipulating materials at nearly an atomic scale. It's not just about making things smaller. It's about how small-scale perfection reshapes our big world. Tiny tech, big leap, revolution in the palm of our hands. The power of small, revolutionizing today, reshaping tomorrow. Micro marvels casting vast ripples into our future, truly powerful. Tiny ripples, giant waves, Micro marvels steering the ship of progress. Micro marvels indeed. It's like the butterfly effect in technology. All those small, precise movements create major shifts. Take microprocessors. They're advancing so rapidly, it's practically magic. We've shrunk them down so much since the 70s, thanks to Moore's Law, and now they power everything from your kitchen blender to robotic surgical arms. In medical tech, there are gadgets that can zip through your blood vessels to spot blockages without a single incision. Watches can keep health stats now, sort of like having a doctor on your wrist. This need for miniaturization has lit a fire under material science too, sparking innovations in new alloys and synthetics that can withstand the high precision demanded by these small scales. Every tiny gear or chip encapsulates centuries of cumulative knowledge and skill. Just nuts. Absolutely, Simon. These pockets of progress where technology is miniature yet mighty are fascinating. What's next? We've harnessed the small to do big things, so what will be the next frontier for these micro-marvels? It's a world expanding, with each tiny advancement having outsized influence on our lives. Where do we go from nano? The possibilities are endless. Speaking of tiny tech, Joe, have you ever heard about those wacky watch complications from way back when? Like, there was this one that was supposed to brew coffee. Imagine waking up and your watch is like, hey bud, need a latte? Just wild. 
and how they show these things in cartoons, gadgets and gears exploding left and right. It's hilarious because it plays right into the fantasy of what we wish our watches could do versus the reality of springs flying across the room. Oh, Simon, those wacky watch complications crack me up. The coffee brewing watch is a perfect example of horological humor where ambition meets absurdity. But let's not forget the real historical oddities, like the watch that doubled as a pistol. Probably not the best idea when checking the time could lead to an accidental discharge. Complications in watches serve functions beyond just time-telling, such as date displays and moon phases. But some ideas were, let's say, overambitious. They reflect a time when watchmakers were also entertainers of sorts, pushing boundaries not only for utility, but for sheer amusement. In pop culture, think back to the spy flicks and cartoons where characters had watches equipped with everything from grappling hooks to lasers. These exaggerated features played into the fantasy of ultra-compact utility, contrasting sharply with the grueling precision needed for even the simplest watch complications. These portrayals tap into our love for what I like to call engineering entertainment. Though we giggle at these comical complications, they underscore an appreciation for creativity in engineering, albeit with a healthy dose of slapstick reality when things don't go quite as planned. Yeah, Joe, those spy watches are a hoot. But you know, sometimes Hollywood goes too easy on us. I'm still waiting for a watch that can make me teleport or turn back time. Grappling hooks and lasers? Kid stuff. Let's up the ante. We're all about the laughs when stuff goes sideways, but let's get real. Sometimes you just want that over-the-top James Bond moment. Like, was it really too much to ask for a sundial watch with a tiny sun attached? Come on, watchmakers. Where's your sense of adventure? These mishaps and fantasies tickle our funny bone because deep down, we love rooting for the underdog invention that's just one gear short of genius. We cherish that profound blend of what if and no way, because at the end of the day, it's about pushing past practicality into the realm of the ridiculous. And that's where the best stories are born. Vintage visions of the future, right? Absolutely, Joe. Like those vintage space age cartoons with watches serving as personal robots. Future tech that's so charmingly off the mark now. The thought back then, Watches could do the cooking, cleaning, even walk your dog for you. Wishful thinking gone wild. Today's smartwatches can check heart rates and messages, sure, but where's the charm in that? I want a watch that accidentally cooks spaghetti during a board meeting or mistakenly orders 100 pizzas when setting an alarm. Now that would make our wrists the real stars of the show. So Simon, which retro watch feature do you wish someone would actually invent today, no matter how outlandish? Oh, I've got the perfect one, Joe. So back in high school, I was the go-to guy for setting up sound equipment for assemblies, not because I was good at it, but because I showed up early once and someone handed me a cable. One day, I'm behind the curtain and there's this rumor about this kid planning to ask his crush to prom during an assembly. He wanted everything timed just right. A spotlight, music, the works. Things go haywire, though. I hit play on what I thought was his romantic playlist. Instead, my watch alarm goes off, loudly blaring the chicken dance song. Imagine that, a fancy watch complication tailor-made for ruining heartfelt moments with poultry-themed polkas. That day, I learned two things. First, check your audio sources twice, and second, timing is indeed everything. The whole thing turned into an accidental icebreaker, though. They did end up going to prom together. So hey, maybe it wasn't such a bad feature after all? I guess even the most ridiculous complications can have unexpected perks. Timing malfunction turned proposal disaster into unexpected win. Classic high school. You've hit the nail right on the clock face, Joe. I mean, who knew a mix-up could turn into matchmaking? But seriously, imagine if watches had a built-in wingman mode. You click a button and boom, it smooths over your social blunders with charm and wit. Like, oh, don't mind Simon's chicken tune interruption, he's here to add flair to your love life. Instant prom king, courtesy of Tech Gone Cuckoo. Hey, so if that wingman watch could have saved you from any other high school blunders, which moment would you have it rescue you from? Oh, easy. Picture this. I'm in biology class, right? 
We've got a pop quiz, and my stomach is making sounds like a whale's mating call. It's loud. So if I had that wingman watch, it would have played some catchy tune to muffle the noise, or even better, announce a fake school-wide announcement about pizza in the cafeteria, emerges as the hero while everyone bolts for the door, leaving me and my whale calls behind. Total blunder blocker. That's hilarious. But you know, Simon, bodily sounds and horology have an interesting history together. Take the cuckoo clock, originally a sort of comical take on timekeeping where a bird calls out the hour. Humor has always been embedded in timepieces. Your whale call episode links back to when watchmakers were akin to jesters or storytellers, crafting novelties that charmed and entertained. Moving from clocks to watches, the goal was often about more than just precision. It was also about personality, sometimes even practical jokes. Consider the rich past of automatons. These mechanical marvels date back to the 18th century and were the ancestors of modern, complicated watches. They would perform incredible tasks, writing, drawing, even playing instruments. I could imagine one designed to camouflage unplanned bodily symphonies. And jumping forward to today, we have smartwatches with numerous apps. It's conceivable to craft an app that responds just as your wingman watch would, turning embarrassing moments into opportune distractions. From historical humor to real-world application, your idea isn't that far off. The legacy continues, just waiting for the next quirky complication to charm our wrists. It's a riot, Joe. Watchmaking's not just cogs and springs. It's got a sense of humor as well-crafted as its gears. Who knew those ticking pieces strapped to our wrists could have such comedic timing? Well, here's hoping for more laughs per hour in the future. What other wacky watch ideas are still waiting to spring to life, I wonder? Speaking of springs to life, Simon, that takes me straight to the roots of watchmaking. The legends in horology weren't just technicians. They were like the alchemists of their time, weaving together art and science. This segues perfectly into tales about legendary watchmakers and some of the most mystique and shrouded watches out there. Have you ever pondered over watches that slip through the cracks of history? These storied timepieces, sometimes stolen or lost, aren't just metal and mechanics. They represent eras of innovation and are symbols of legacy. They mark the milestones of our heritage and horology and measure more than time. They gauge human endeavor. Just as a magician never reveals his secrets, some watches keep their stories hidden, shrouded in legend. What really intrigues me is the watches we hear about in whispers, but rarely or never see. Hey, apologies, Joe, but we gotta wrap this up for now. Guess even the best conversations about the ticks and talks of time have their own curfew. To everyone who's been listening, a big thank you for tuning in and sharing laughs and gab with us. Remember, keep your watches wound and your stories ready because we're doing it all over again tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. Don't be late. Unlike Simon's infamous high school quiz, it's one appointment where timing is everything. Catch you on the next tick, folks. No sweat, Simon. Thanks to the listeners for sticking with us and diving into the deep end of the watch pool. But wait, think about this until next time. What if one of those mythical watches resurfaced? What secrets of the past could unwind from its gears? Imagine a long-lost watch from a legendary maker showing up on your wrist what untold history might tick within. It's not just gears and sapphire glass that make these pieces extraordinary, it's their silent witness to history's march. Each lost treasure ticking out there is a puzzle piece of our human story. Quite a timely thought to ponder, isn't it? So, remember to tune in again, because who knows which forgotten tales will recover from the vault of time. Don't let daylight savings catch you off guard. Until then, keep your watch wound and your ears open. Time flies, but we're here to catch it. Catch you on the flip side.